I know he's got a special message for us this morning, so. Good to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning. It's good to see you all. We get a long weekend this weekend. We get to one more day to do all the stuff that we need to do and go, don't get time for them during the week. And uh, it's been so beautifully sunny out there. It's, it's even been hot. I was talking with Mo before the service and we were, we were talking about grass. And she, uh, I think she's probably got a residential property, so she's talking about having to mow the lawn. And I'm like, I've got a lifestyle block. So I'm like, yes, my grass is growing so I can feed my cows. And um, so it's that, that bittersweet between residential and the um, rural community, but it was a bit of a laugh, it was pretty cool. Hey, just before I get started, um, I've got a cool story. Uh, I shared this actually at home group on Wednesday night, and uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of, so it's actually quite a fun sort of a way to start ministering to people. Because uh, Sarah said to me, uh, said to the home group at, at, at one stage a few months ago, that we owe people an encounter. We owe people an encounter. And so I'm talking about the Great Commission, all right? To go forth and make disciples of all nations. And that hit me, and it sort of reactivated me and re-energized me to, to start reaching out to people. And at work, I have to go and deliver um, some of our vehicles to panel beaters and things like that. And I've got no one to sort of around to help me get back to my office. And so I had to take an Uber. And so I figured out, well, these Uber guys have trapped with me for 15 to 20 minutes. Why don't I just tell them about Jesus? So I've been talking to um, Hindu folks, Punjabi folks, Iranian folks, and um, and really been enjoying them. The other day I had the pleasure of um, having an Iranian driver. And so I started asking him, you know, is he, a, uh, is he a Muslim? And he said, yes. And I said, oh, that's cool. And he goes, I said, I'm, I'm a Christian. And he, and he goes, oh, so you're a brother. And I said, I'm not quite sure about that. But I said, I, I love I love the, um, you know, the sentiment there. And um, and I said, so you, you know the Quran and everything like that? And he said, yes, yes. And I said, so tell me, is it true that the, the Bible, oh, I'm sorry, the, the Quran, confirms that the Bible is 100% true, because the Quran is 100% true. And he goes, no. And I said, but you just said that the Quran was 100% true, so therefore the Bible is 100% true. And that means that Jesus died on the cross, he rose again, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, and is Muhammad's God and judge. I said, I think, I think you're on the right hand side of the aisle, buddy. <laughs> and he goes, no, no. And he started, he, he got so flustered, he started speaking in Arabic telling me about sections of the Quran and and I couldn't really understand him because it was quite broken English as well. I said to him, mate, I, I don't really understand you. Um, but I said, I, I love your heart here and I love how passionate you are about the Quran. And I said, can I, um, when we stop, I said, can I pray for you? Can I bless you? And so I got the chance to lay hands on this man. He accepted it and uh, for Jesus Christ to reveal himself to this man. And, um, and I, I got out of that cab and I was so pumped that I got to pray for this man. And so that's now my new mission field. I am going to be evangelizing to Uber drivers whenever I get the chance. They'll probably start avoiding me. I'll probably stand there and no one's backing me up. But, <laughs> but hopefully they will and, and we'll start evangelizing. So I want to tell that story just to encourage you, just in your sphere of influence, who are you reaching out to? In your world, who are you reaching out there? God has put you there to reach out to the lost. To, to say to them, hey, I've got some really good news for you. And that's Jesus Christ as Lord and King. And he, if you let him, he'll come and change your life. So if you can, if you can do that, if you can lay, get the chance to lay hands on people and, and, and reach out to them, I just encourage you to do it. It's actually really fun when you get a cool buzz off it later on. You're just like, woo, and you're praying, praying to God and thanking Him so much for what He's doing. Anyway, um, I'll carry on now. I'm just going to just pray. Thank you, Father, for today. Thank you, Lord, for sunshine. 
Thank you, Lord, for long weekends. Thank you, Father, for the message you've got today, Father. Would you just let it sink deep into our hearts, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jason. I'm, I'm part of the setup team here, so all the stuff that you see, we've got a team that helps set it all up, and, and I help to run that. And every now and then, I get the opportunity to speak, which is really cool, and stuff. So I really enjoy being up here delivering the message to school. Um, and I want to thank Doreen, who's helped me with my presentation. Um, she, um, she offered to do me PowerPoint, because um, she said to me, um, I can't keep up with all the scripture you've got in there, so can we have a PowerPoint and I'll do it for you. So I was like, okay. So it's been a really awesome gift, the second time she's done it now, and she does a fantastic job, so thank you, Doreen. So today we're going to be continuing on from um, Josephine last week. She started on our Heart of Worship series. And I'm going to be talking about the writings of Jesus. Now, you might think that this is a little bit of a strange subject because, or, or, or way to sort of angle a sermon because Jesus has no recorded writings. He has no books. There's no mention in the Gospels that he wrote anything down at all. But while he may not have written on papyrus or letter scroll as they did back then, he did write in or on a few other mediums. So here's the adventure, right? Because I get pretty excited about this stuff, so I, I class it as an adventure. I, I, I get pretty stoked about it. Um, what did Jesus write? Where did he write it? And what does it mean to us regarding the heart of worship, our current series, which is looking at the whom and the why of worship? So whom do we worship and why do we worship the home? Um, in order to do this, like I, I love connecting the New Testament and the Old Testament together because for me, it's even though it's 66 books and you've got that divide between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it actually runs with one theme from beginning to end and it's all talking about Jesus. So we can dig back into the Old Testament using the lens of the New Testament to look back on it and discover Jesus there. So that's what I love doing. It's it's um, it's so much fun, and it gets you really excited, in my opinion, about reading your Bibles. It's pretty cool. So our overarching um, scripture for this adventure, for this journey, is Ezekiel thirty six twenty five to twenty seven. I'll read it out. Oh, John has got it already. Legend, mate. Um, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues. I will, um, keep my, you will keep my judgments and will do them. So as we continue, keep this verse in your mind. Um, particular attention, with particular attention to the part where God is saying that he will take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh so that we can view the place that Jesus takes us from that place of hardness the same kind of hardness that Pharaoh had if you know in Exodus that Pharaoh hardened his heart to the commands of God that Moses was giving him to let his people go that's the same hardness of heart we're talking about okay the heart that is averse to God all right so Jesus takes us from that place if we let him to a place of flesh, to a place of life. Jesus came to give life. It's in this process that we can learn the who we worship and the why we worship. So I always like to start from the beginning. Usually there's something in Genesis, there's some little goodies in there that, that we can go back and have a look at. And uh, So I'm going to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Um, Actually, I'll just, I'll just start at verse 7 there, I think. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. So this is man becoming flesh at creation, right? As God breathes into him. Sinless Adam, the first man, is created with a heart of flesh. His heart being flesh in a spiritual sense as well. Man was made with a heart that could live life with God. A close and personal walk with the Lord. There is a softness inherent with this heart of flesh. A softness that is open to and able to hear God and abide in His Word. But as we know, the fall happened, man fell. 
the closest once enjoyed with God was no more. God being holy cannot have sin for him. And the relationship formed by God with man and man's creation was torn apart. Leaving man in sin with a hardened heart to God and by extension God's word we couldn't hear him anymore. Our hearts were adverse to him we become like Pharaoh. In Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 19, Paul is speaking about Christian living or a Christian-like life, and it reads, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge, indulge in every kind of impurity. They are full of greed. Notice how Paul is saying that those who are separate from the life of God is because of their heart and hearts. Their hearts are made of stone. There is no life in them. Life is the word of God. Life is Jesus. He says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so with our heart and hearts, our hearts made of stone, We've got to ask the question, what was, what, how did Jesus start this process of transformation? How did he start writing on our hearts? Well, Exodus 31, 18. This is Jesus writing on stone. So, and when he made an end of him, um, speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. So two tablets of stone written on the finger of God. The, the stone is the image of our hearts, the image of our fallen condition, hardened to the word of God. God writing on the stone was a promise that he would restore us to him by his word. Now, how that looks is that when, when you want to know if something is wrong, you need so a crooked line, you need a straight line to hold up to it to see that it is crooked, otherwise you don't know that it is a crooked line. And that's what the word of God, the writing of the Ten Commandments did as the law writing on the stone. It held up to us, saying to us that we had gone astray, that we had gone amiss, that something was wrong, it wasn't right, and that's what it did for us. It was the to hold the, the perfect against the imperfect so that we could see what had gone wrong. So the solution to our hearts of stone is transformation by the word of God. That's what the law was meant for. The Ten Commandments were given by the grace of God. A lot of people think that the Ten Commandments were given to go, Hey, don't do this, don't do that. But that's not true at all. They were... They were they were the grace of God given to the people. The Israelites viewed them as wonderful, wonderful grace because it showed them how to live. Because everything, well, everything, um, very little was, was taken off the table and saying you can't do that. Everything else was permissible. All right? So it was, it was, it was a simple law to keep, really. So God's word is Jesus. Jesus is a promise written on our hearts of stone. The perfect word, the perfect cure for hearts of stone. God in writing these words by his own finger was saying to us, if you want to soften your hearts and return to me, it's going to take my word, it's going to take my truth living in you. It's going to take me to do for you what you cannot do for yourselves. Because we're pretty used to say, we're often likened to sheep. You know, we're likened to sheep. In the Bible, pretty silly, pretty useless, can't do much for ourselves. So that's why it's going to take Jesus to come and come and take over and, and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Now, you might say to me, hold on a minute, you just said Jesus wrote on the stone previously. And the scripture clearly says Yahweh, it was Yahweh who wrote on the stone, the finger of God. So it's not Jesus there? And I say, like, yeah, you know, good point, good point. But the thing is, if we see even a toe, a hand, an eye, a head, by way of function of the Trinity, 
So how the Trinity functions in their individual per personages. Then we are seeing Jesus by function because he is the image of the invisible God. And it says this in Colossians 1, um, 15 through 18. The message version says, we look at the Son and we see the God who cannot be seen. We look at the Son and see God's original purpose in everything created. <coughs> And so that's why I say, if you see something like a, a hand or a personage in the Old Testament, then you're actually looking at Jesus. Now, he's still God. I'm not dividing up the Trinity here. I'm not saying that he is singular and apart from him. I'm just talking about how they function in their personage. It normally says in the King James Version that he is Christ, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. But I just, I just thought I'd use a message because I just love the way that it says, we look at the sun, we see the God who cannot be seen. So when that finger of God wrote on that stone to tell us that we've gone wrong and this is, this is the path forward to, to get right, that was Jesus. He was there because it also says that Moses spoke with God as like a friend face to face. So Moses in the Old Testament was talking with Jesus. Jesus writes on the earth. So we're, we're getting into the next thing now. Jesus writes on the earth, so the dirt, the sand. You notice how as we, as we progress through this, the mediums in which he writes are going to get softer because that's the process we go through. Once we recognize the word of God in our lives and Jesus working in our lives, then our hearts start to soften. And this process takes over, this softening process takes over. So Jesus also wrote on the earth. John 8, 2 to, um, through to 11, um, it says, Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught him. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought him, a woman who was caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that we sh um, that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this, testing him, that he might have something of, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them. Who is without sin among you? He who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone at her. And again he stood down and wrote on the ground. And then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman, standing in the midst. When Jesus raised himself up and saw that no one but the um, woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And, and Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, so I'm talking about what Jesus is writing on, right? So let's, let's have a look at that. He's now writing on the ground, maybe dirt, sand, as I said. Um, and it's getting softer. So as we journey, it gets softer. People and theologians have all had many ideas on what Jesus wrote here. But the truth is no one knows. No one knows what he wrote. And so I'm not going to even go into the different ideas. It's like, because I think it's just kind of pointless. It's like we're just speculating, we're guessing, it's just conjecture. Although I believe it would be awesome to know what he did write. It's probably the most profound thing ever, right? I mean, it's, it's God writing on the ground. Um, but uh, it's still it's interesting to see him writing in this moment as it f fulfills prophecy. To this effect, we should always remind ourselves just how purposeful Jesus is in his ministry. He is always about his Father's business. He doesn't miss a beat. He's incredible. And, and as you read through the Gospels, you see prophecy fulfilled, prophecy fulfilled, prophecy fulfilled. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's always got his mind on what his 
We are what his father has shown him and where his father is leading him. He's always going out in prayer and seeking his father. So let's connect John 8 here with Jeremiah 17 verse 13. Using the lens of the New Testament to look back on the Old Testament with which we can see Jesus either in form, so an actual appearance, pre-incarnate appearance, or symbolically, like symbolically would be the manna from heaven, right? Jesus is likened to the bread of heaven. <laughs> we really must get in our heads just how much the Old Testament speaks of the coming Messiah in crazy details, and they only fit one person in all of history, and that's Jesus. So Jeremiah 17 says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. This gives John eight a different spin for sure, right? Who is the Lord? The hope of Israel? It's Jesus. Then as we see um, in John 8, the Pharisees all by one walking away until there's nobody left of them. All while Jesus is stooped down writing in the earth. So you see there, he's writing the earth. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, says Jeremiah. Then Jeremiah carries on, because they have forsaken the fountain of living waters. At this point, you may say, okay, mate, good one, but they're all walking away. But how do you connect this part of scripture with Jesus being the living fountain of water? Well, often when we read scripture, the verses preceding it give us the context to what's going on here. Um, and just before this moment, we see Jesus in John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39, standing in the temple declaring that he is the very source of those living waters. So just before this happens, just before the Pharisees walk away from Jesus, who is riding in the ground, before they depart from him, who is the living waters, we see this prophecy being, being sort of set in context. It says, on the last of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this, he, um, but this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the full connection to what Jesus is saying and doing in John 7 and 8 can be seen here as we look back to Jeremiah. Who did the Pharisees forsake? The fountain of living waters. Who did they walk away from? The fountain of living waters. They walked away more concerned about the law they couldn't live up to than that the law would live, live than the law that would live in them as the promise of the indwelling spirit. That's what was going on here. So the Old Testament constantly pointing us, pointing us to Jesus. It's really cool. And just as a segue, I couldn't help but touch on this. It's so cool um, to see how Jesus judges the woman caught in adultery. He judges her by the law of Moses and does not sin in letting her go. He does not sin in letting her go. Because Deuteronomy 17 verse 6 says, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. So Jesus was left there standing as the only witness. There was no witness. And he could have condemned her, but he didn't. He let her go. It's just really cool. The way our Lord conducts himself is beyond amazing. No man in all of history is his measure. Truly, he is God. So the final one, we're getting through this. We're seeing, seeing everything soften as we head through this. Jesus writing on the stone, writing in the dirt, and in the final place he writes in is our hearts. Hebrews 18. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. The context of this verse is new covenant. And it's the third place we find the writings of Jesus. The third promise to show the fulfillment of the first one. That he will restore us himself, um, us to himself by his word. The second promise that he would pour out his Holy Spirit upon us, leading us to write his law on our hearts. What once was stone and hardened is now made soft and flesh by the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit and the law made livable by the word of God, Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. 
So there's also a, like a, a trinity in these three sections as well. We see Yahweh, the Father, in the first section in Genesis. We see, sorry, in Exodus. Um, we see in, in John 8, we see the Son. And then the writing on our hearts in Hebrew, we see the Holy Spirit because that's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to do it for us. And that all ties back into Ezekiel 36, 25, 27. Can we have that one, John? You got it. You're the man. Um, I'll read it again because it connects all these three elements where Jesus is writing. I will then sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take out your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a new heart of, and give you a new heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will keep you. You will keep my judgments and, and will do them. Can I just ask the worship team to join me, please? This is where we see all three places Jesus wrote here. They are drawn together, our heart and hearts, replaced by hearts of flesh. The whom we worship is Jesus. The why we worship him is because he loved us first. So that our heart and hearts could be brought to life, made flesh, to know him, to love him in return. His spirit placed within us so that we may walk in his ways, live out his laws by his grace and sacrifice because he loves us. And you know, there's, he loves us so much. And there's, there's one scripture I always come back to that sums up this why and this how is he comes and really resonates with our softened hearts through this journey. And it's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now I know you can think that this verse has been done to death, right? But I think completely the opposite. I think we need to hear it almost on a daily basis. That he came. That he so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that we know in the deepest part of our hearts that we are loved by Jesus. We thought it not robbery to leave his glory, to stoop down, to save a rotten creature like me. And that's far, far more than enough for me to know the who and the why of worship. I look at that and instantly my heart is lifted with my hands in surrender and adoration of the one who is worthy of it all. Just keep that in your mind that verse, that scripture, as we worship together in our final song, the man, Jesus Christ, the God who is worthy of it all. God bless.